Section 15 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Trong in Houston, Texas. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 8 Joy, High Spirits, Love, Tender Feelings, Devotion, Part 1. Laughter, primarily the expression of joy, ludicrous ideas, movement of the features during laughter, nature of the sound produced, the secretions of tears during loud laughter, gradations from loud laughter to gentle smiling, high spirits, the expression of love, tender feelings, devotion. Joy, when intense, leads to various purposeless movements, to dancing about, clapping the hands, stamping, and to loud laughter. Laughter seems primarily to be the expression of mere joy or happiness. We clearly see this in children at play, who are almost incessantly laughing. With young persons past childhood, when they are in high spirits, there is always much meaningless laughter. The laughter of the gods is described by Homer as the exuberance of their celestial joy after their daily banquet. A man smiles, and smiling, as we shall see, graduates into laughter, at meeting an old friend in the street, as he does at any trifling pleasure, such as smelling a sweet perfume. Laura Brickman, from her blindness and deafness, could not have acquired any expression through imitation. Yet, when a letter from a beloved friend was communicated to her by gesture language, she laughed and clapped her hands, and the color mounted to her cheeks. On other occasions, she has been seen to stamp for joy. Idiots and imbecile persons likewise afford good evidence that laughter or smiling primarily expresses mere happiness or joy. Dr. Critton Brown, to whom, as on so many other occasions, I am indebted for the results of his wide experience, informs me that with idiots, laughter is the most prevalent and frequent of all the emotional expressions. Many idiots are morose, passionate, restless, in a painful state of mind, or utterly stolid, and these never laugh. Others frequently laugh in a quite senseless manner. Thus, an idiot boy, incapable of speech, complained to Dr. Brown by the aid of signs that another boy in the asylum had given him a black eye, and this was accompanied by explosions of laughter and with his face covered with the broadest smiles. There is another class of idiots who are persistently joyous and benign, and who are constantly laughing or smiling. Their countenances often exhibit a stereotyped smile. Their joyousness is increased, and they grin, chuckle, or giggle whenever food is placed before them, or when they are caressed, are shown bright colors, or hear music. Some of them laugh more than usual when they walk about, or attempt any muscular exertion. The joyousness of most of these idiots cannot possibly be associated, as Dr. Brown remarks, with any distinct ideas. They simply feel pleasure and express it by laughter or smiles. With imbeciles rather higher in the scale, personal vanity seems to be the commonest cause of laughter, and next to this, pleasure arising from the approbation of their conduct. With grown-up persons, laughter is excited by causes considerably different from those which suffice during childhood, but this remark hardly applies to smiling. Laughter in this respect is analogous with weeping, which with adults is almost confined to mental distress, while with children it is excited by bodily pain or any suffering, as well as by fear or rage. Many curious discussions have been written on the causes of laughter with grown-up persons. The subject is extremely complex. Something incongruous or unaccountable, exciting surprise and some sense of superiority in the laughter, who must be in a happy frame of mind, seems to be the commonest cause. 
the circumstances must not be of a momentous nature no poor man would laugh or smile on suddenly hearing that a large fortune had been bequeathed to him if the mind is strongly excited by pleasurable feelings and any little unexpected event or thought occurs then as mr herbert spencer remarks a large amount of nervous energy instead of being allowed to expend itself in producing an equivalent amount of the new thoughts and emotion which were nascent is suddenly checked in its flow the excess must discharge itself in some other direction and there result an efflux through the motor nerves to various classes of the muscles producing the half convulsive actions we term laughter an observation bearing on this point was made by a correspondent during the recent siege of paris namely that the german soldiers after strong excitement from exposure to extreme danger were particularly apt to burst out into loud laughter at the smallest joke so again when young children are just beginning to cry an unexpected event will sometimes suddenly turn their crying into laughter which apparently serves equally well to expend the superflux nervous energy the imagination is sometimes said to be tickled by a ludicrous idea and this so-called tickling of the mind is curiously analogous with that of the body every one knows how immoderate children laugh and how their whole bodies are convulsed when they are tickled the anthropoid apes as we have seen likewise utter a reiterated sound corresponding with our laughter when they are tickled especially under the armpits i touch with a bit of paper the sole of the foot of one of my infants when only seven days old and it was suddenly jerked away and the toes curled about as in an older child such movements as well as laughter from being tickled are manifestly reflex actions and this is likewise shown by the minute unstriped muscles which serve to erect the separate hairs on the body contracting near a tickled surface yet laughter from ludicrous idea though involuntary cannot be called a strictly reflex action in this case and in that of laughter from being tickled the mind must be in a pleasurable condition a young child if tickled by a strange man would scream from fear the touch must be light and an idea or event to be ludicrous must not be of grave import the parts of the body which are most easily tickled are those which are not commonly touched such as the armpits or between the toes or parts such as the soles of the feet which are habitually touched by a broad surface but the surface on which we sit offers a marked exception to this rule according to gratiolet certain nerves are much more sensitive to tickling than others from the fact that a child can hardly tickle itself or in a much less degree than when tickled by another person it seems that the precise point to be touched must not be known so with the mind something unexpected a novel or incongruous idea which breaks through an habitual train of thought appears to be a strong element in the ludicrous the sound of laughter is produced by a deep inspiration followed by short interrupted spasmodic contractions of the chest and especially the diaphragm hence we hear of laughter holding both his sides from the shaking of the body the head nods to and fro the lower jaw often quivers up and down as is likewise the case with some species of baboons when they are much pleased the tendency in the zygomatic muscles to contract under pleasurable emotions is shown by a curious fact communicated to me by dr brown with respect to patients suffering from general paralysis of the insane in this malady there is almost invariably optimism delusions as to wealth rank grandeur insane joyousness benevolence and profusion while its very earliest physical symptom is trembling at the corners of the mouth and at the outer corners of the eyes this is a well-recognized fact constant tremulous agitation of the inferior palpebral and great zygomatic muscles is pathognomic of the earlier stages of general paralysis the countenance has a pleased and benevolent expression 
as the disease advances other muscles become involved but until complete fatuity is reached the prevailing expression is that of feeble benevolence as in laughing and broadly smiling the cheeks and upper lip are much raised the nose appears to be shortened and the skin on the bridge becomes finely wrinkled in transverse lines with other oblique longitudinal lines on the sides the upper front teeth are commonly exposed a well-marked nasolabial fold is formed which runs from the wing of each nostril to the corner of the mouth and this fold is often double in old persons a bright and sparkling eye is as characteristic of a pleased or amused state of mind as is the retraction of the corners of the mouth and upper lip with the wrinkles thus produced even the eyes of microcephalous idiots who are so degraded that they never learn to speak brighten slightly when they are pleased under extreme laughter the eyes are too much suffused with tears to sparkle but the moisture squeezed out of the glands during moderate laughter or smiling may aid in giving them lustre though this must be of altogether subordinate importance as they become dull from grief though they are then often moist their brightness seems to be chiefly due to their tenseness owing to the contraction of the orbicular muscles and to the pressure of the raised cheeks but according to dr pederick who has discussed this point more fully than any other writer the tenseness may be largely attributed to the eyeballs becoming filled with blood and other fluids from the acceleration of the circulation consequent on the excitement of pleasure he remarks on the contrast in the appearance of the eyes of a hectic patient with a rapid circulation and of a man suffering from cholera with almost all the fluids of his body drained from him any cause which lowers the circulation deadens the eye i remember seeing a man utterly prostrated by prolonged and severe exertion during a very hot day and a bystander compared his eyes to those of a boiled codfish to return to the sounds produced during laughter we can see in a vague manner how the utterance of sounds of some kind would naturally become associated with a pleasurable state of mind for throughout a large part of the animal kingdom vocal or instrumental sounds are employed either as a call or as a charm by one sex for the other they are also employed as the means for a joyful meeting between the parents and their offspring and between the attached members of the same social community but why the sounds which man utters when he is pleased have the peculiar reiterated character of laughter we do not know nevertheless we can see that they would naturally be as different as possible from the screams or cries of distress and as in the production of the later the expirations are prolonged and continuous with the inspirations short and interrupted so it might perhaps have been expected with the sounds uttered from joy that the expirations would have been short and broken with the inspirations prolonged and this is the case it is an equally obscure point why the corners of the mouth are retracted and the upper lip raised during ordinary laughter the mouth must not be open to its utmost extent for when this occurs during a paroxysm of excessive laughter hardly any sound is emitted or it changes its tone and seems to come from deep down in the throat the respiratory muscles and even those of the limbs are at the same time thrown into rapid vibratory movements the lower jaw often partakes of this movement and this would tend to prevent the mouth from being widely opened but as a full volume of sound has to be poured forth the orifice of the mouth must be large and it is perhaps to gain this end that the corners are retracted and the upper lip raised although we can hardly account for the shape of the mouth during laughter which leads to wrinkles being formed beneath the eyes nor for the peculiar reiterated sound of laughter nor for the quivering of the jaws nevertheless we may infer that all these effects are due to some common cause for they are all characteristics and expressive of a pleased state of mind in various kinds of monkeys a graduated series can be followed from violent to moderate laughter 
to a broad smile to a gentle smile and to the expression of mere cheerfulness during excessive laughter the whole body is often thrown backward and shakes or is almost convulsed the respiration is much disturbed the head and face become gorged with blood with the veins distended and the orbicular muscles are spasmodically contracted in order to protect the eyes tears are freely shed hence as formerly remarked it is scarcely possible to point out any difference between the tear-stained face of a person after a paroxysm of excessive laughter and after a bitter crying fit it is probably due to the close similarity of the spasmodic movements caused by these widely different emotions that hysteric patients alternately cry and laugh with violence and that young children sometimes pass suddenly from the one to the other state mr swingho informs me that he has often seen the chinese when suffering from deep grief burst out into hysterical fits of laughter i was anxious to know whether tears are freely shed during excessive laughter by most of the races of men and i hear from my correspondence that this is the case one instance was observed with the hindus and they themselves said that it often occurred so it is with the chinese the women of the wild tribe of malays in malacca peninsula sometimes shed tears when they laugh heartily though this seldom occurs with the diaks of borneo it must frequently be the case at least with the women for i hear from the Raja sea brook that it is a common expression with them to say we nearly make tears from laughter the aborigines of australia express their emotions freely and they are described by my correspondents as jumping about and clapping their hands for joy and as often roaring with laughter no less than four observers have seen their eyes freely watering on such occasions and in one instance the tears rolled down their cheeks mr bulmer a missionary in a remote part of victoria remarks that they have a keen sense of the ridiculous they are excellent mimics and when one of them is able to imitate the peculiarities of some absent member of the tribe it is very common to hear all in the camp convulsed with laughter with europeans hardly anything excites laughter so easily as mimicry and it is rather curious to find the same fact with the savages of australia who constitute one of the most distinct races in the world in southern africa with the two tribes of kaffirs especially with the women their eyes often fill with tears during laughter gaika the brother of the chief sandili answered my query on this bead with the words yes that is their common practice sir andrew smith has seen the painted face of a hottentot woman all furrowed with tears after a fit of laughter in northern africa with the abyssinians tears are secreted under the same circumstances lastly in north america the same fact has been observed in a remarkably savage and isolated tribe but chiefly with the women in another tribe it was observed only on a single occasion excessive laughter as before remarked graduate into moderate laughter in this later case the muscles round the eyes are much less contracted and there is little or no frowning between a gentle laugh and a broad smile there is hardly any difference excepting that in smiling no reiterated sound is uttered though a single rather strong expiration or slight noise a rudiment of a laugh may often be heard at the commencement of a smile on a moderately smiling countenance the contraction of the upper orbicular muscles can still just be traced by a slight lowering of the eyebrows the contraction of the lower orbicular and palpebral muscles is much plainer and is shown by the wrinkling of the lower eyelids and of the skin beneath them together with a slight drawing up of the upper lip from the broadest smile we pass by the finest steps into the gentlest one in this later case the features are moved in a much less degree and much more slowly and the mouth is kept closed the curvature of the nasolabial furrow is also slightly different in the two cases we thus see that no abrupt line of demarcation can be drawn between the movement of the features during the most violent laughter and a very faint smile 
a smile therefore may be said to be the first stage in the development of a laugh but a different and more probable view may be suggested namely that the habit of uttering low reiterated sounds from a sense of pleasure first led to the retraction of the corners of the mouth and of the upper lip and to the contraction of the orbicular muscles and that now through association and long continued habit the same muscles are brought into slight play whenever any cause excites in us a feeling which if stronger would have led to laughter and the result is a smile whether we look at laughter as the full development of a smile or as is more probable at the gentle smile as the last trace of a habit firmly fixed during many generations of laughing whenever we are joyful we can follow in our infants the gradual passage of the one into the other it is well known to those who have the charge of young infants that it is difficult to feel sure when certain movements about their mouths are really expressive that is when they really smile hence i carefully watched my own infants one of them at the age of forty-five days and being at the time in a happy frame of mind smiled that is the corners of the mouth were retracted and simultaneously the eyes became decidedly bright i observed the same thing on the following day but on the third day the child was not quite well and there was no trace of a smile and this renders it probable that the previous smiles were real eight days subsequently and during the next succeeding week it was remarkable how his eyes brightened whenever he smiled and his nose became at the same time transversely wrinkled this was now accompanied by a little bleating noise which perhaps represented a laugh at the age of a hundred and thirteen days these little noises which were always made during expiration assume a slightly different character and were more broken and interrupted as in sobbing and this was certainly incipient laughter the change in tone seemed to me at the time to be connected with the greater lateral extension of the mouth as the smiles became broader in a second infant the first real smile was observed at about the same age viz forty-five days and in a third at a somewhat earlier age the second infant when sixty-five days old smiled much more broadly and plainly than did the one first mentioned at the same age and even at this early age uttered noises very like laughter in this gradual acquirement by infants of the habit of laughing we have a case in some degree analogous to that of weeping as practice is requisite with the ordinary movements of the body such as walking so it seems to be with laughing and weeping the art of screamings on the other hand from being of service to infants has become finely developed from the earliest days end of section fifteen recording by mike tron in houston texas